Um, so hello and welcome to this special EG webinar on how to measure the earth, an introduction to geodesy. My name is Simon Clark. I'm the EGU's Projects Coordination Officer. Uh, I will shortly introduce the speakers, but to begin with, uh, I just want to note that this webinar will last a maximum of one hour, with time dedicated to audience questions and answers at the end. If you have any questions, you can uh, ask them at any time by inputting them into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. You can also upvote questions you think are relevant and want the uh, panelists to answer. Um, this webinar will also be recorded and uploaded to the EGU uh, YouTube channel uh, within a week's time. Uh, our YouTube channel is EU Geosciences. So uh, to introduce our today's speakers, we have Andreas Kvar, a postdoc at the Institute of Geodesy in Graz University of Technology in Austria. Rebecca Steffen, a researcher at the Lands Materiat, the Swedish Mapping, Cadastral and Land Registration Authority. Uh, and Benedict Soja, uh, Assistant Professor of Space Geodesy at ETH Zurich, Switzerland. So, Andreas, would you like to begin? Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for this nice introduction, Simon. And let's start with the technical part of the day in this webinar, which we titled How to Measure the Earth, an Introduction to Geodesy. Um, before we start with technical definitions, um, I want to raise the question, what is geodesy? And uh, we ask this question actually at this year's uh, General Assembly in the Geodesy 101 short course that we held. And we got quite a variety of, of answers, um, starting from very technical ones, like coordinate system, uh, satellite observations, gravimetry, but also some more general and, and um, a little bit more um, uh, fun ones, like uh, job security, uh, fun, um, uh, and a lot of applications like faults, um, tsunami early warning, early warning um, and so on. But uh, to give this a little bit more uh, a rigorous context, generally when we talk about geodesy, we mean that it's the geoscience of accurately measuring and understanding Earth's geometric shape Earth's orientation in space and Earth's gravity field and mass change within the Earth system. So we have these three subfields, which in practice are very closely interconnected. And each of these subfields gives us uh, key insights in how our very dynamic planet changes and um, uh, gives us very uh, key insights in what, for example, we can do to mitigate um, uh, climate change, for example. Um, starting with the geometric shape of the Earth, uh, when we talk about this, we do not only mean, uh, for example, the topography, so the, the land area, the land surface, where we, for example, would measure um, land subsidence uh, as a cause of groundwater depletion. So uh, geodesy can measure um, if land sinks, whether it be inland or in this uh, other plot that I, that I show here uh, in the coastal area, so we have, where we have coastal subsidence, but um, we also measure uh, the ocean surface. So we now have a very long time series of um, changes in sea surface height, um, which uh, obviously uh, uh, reflects the sea level change that we have. Um, the second subfield is Earth's orientation in space. And this essentially is the connection between Earth and space. Uh, so the connection between terrestrial applications and uh, space-borne uh, applications. So if you, in your uh, scientific studies, use, for example, uh, the image uh, of a remote sensing satellite, then you have to very accurately know where this satellite was at a given point in time in relation to 
uh, the point on the Earth's surface that you want to investigate. Um, and this is where the orientation in space and Earth rotation comes into play. And finally, um, we have uh, Earth's gravity field. And as you know, if we have a mass somewhere, this generates a gravitational field. And so by measuring the gravity field, uh, we can essentially weigh things. And in an Earth science context, uh, which things can we weigh? Uh, for example, ice sheets or, or glaciers. So by measuring the gravity field, we can determine how much mass a glaciated area loses over time. And the same thing uh, we can apply to, for example, uh, large aquifers. So we can essentially look below Earth's surface through the gravity field and see whether groundwater uh, is lost or a groundwater aquifer is not uh, recharging anymore. Um, we can also weigh the ocean, so we can create a time series of ocean mass change, um, but also look at solid earth processes like the co-seismic mass change when we have a large earthquake. So how much mass is actually moved when um, uh, two um, plates uh, are displaced by an earthquake, for example. And to make this a little bit more concrete, um, I look through the General Assembly uh, 2022 uh, Geodesy Division abstracts and just compile the word cloud. And you can see a lot of the uh, stuff that I already mentioned is reflected in these abstracts. So we have obviously Earth, because that's more or less uh, always the thing that we want to measure in some way. We have deformation, we have gravity, we have change. So we are looking at temporal changes, obviously. But, and um, I just uh, blew these words up a little bit. Um, we also have a lot of applications in there. So uh, geodesy is always uh, involved with quite a lot of other disciplines. So uh, we look at ice sheet mass change, water storage variations, uh, faults, surface deformation, earthquakes, and so on. And with a few geodetic techniques that we have, uh, we have observation time series that reach now 20, 30 years. So now we can also start looking into uh, effects of climate change that we can see in our measurements. Um, if we kind of reverse this process uh, with this word cloud and just look at how many or uh, in all of the abstracts that were submitted to this year's GA, mention geodetic techniques or core concepts like uh, global navigation satellite systems or the GRACE uh, satellite mission, sea level alt altimetry, we can see that uh, almost all uh, EGU divisions um, kind of are interconnected with geodesy and vice versa. So uh, to answer the question in geodesy, or just partly answer that. Uh, I would say that uh, geodesy is the geoscience of accurately measuring and understanding Earth's geometric shape, its orientation in space and gravity field. And it is very densely interconnected with the whole geoscientific field. And with that, um, I will then hand over to Benedict who will talk about uh, geometry. Yes, thank you very much, Andreas, for the first part of the talk and Simon for the introduction. It's now my pleasure to tell you a little bit about geodesy and its role to determine the geometry or the shape of the Earth. Now, why should we do this? Um, as we have seen in the first examples shown by Andreas, yeah, the Earth is not completely solid and rigid. There's actually a lot going on. And uh, the most important aspect is, of course, when uh, humans are uh, affected, for example, uh, in the case of strong earthquakes or landslides. And yeah, uh, geodesy can, uh, in this case, contribute with measuring the change in the earth uh, deformation. And yeah, not only in such extreme examples, but also for very long and uh, yeah, uh, slow processes, for example, related to the uh, load uh, due to 
uh, melting glaciers or related to post-glacial rebound. Geodesy can make a very important contribution to our understanding of these physical processes. Now, how do we determine the geometry and the changes in uh, the Earth's crust? We have several space geodetic techniques that can be used to uh, monitor uh, the Earth and its shape. Maybe most important of these shown here would be the Global Navigation Satellite Systems, GNSS, which I will talk about in more detail, but there are also quite a few other suitable techniques such as very long baseline interferometry, VLBI, which observes extra galactic radio sources, satellite laser ranging, SLR, or Doppler orbitography and radio position integrated by satellite, which is the DORIS system. Since we are now focusing on GNSS, I will give you a short introduction. GNSS stands for Global Navigation Satellite Systems, in the sense of global, meaning that it's accessible anywhere, anytime on the world, and it's also independent of weather. It can be used for uh, navigation, which maybe most people know about. For example, you can determine your three dimensional position and the change in position, so the velocity, and it can also be used for precise timing. And yes, it's a satellite system, which means that all the services are provided by a lot of satellites that orbit the Earth. And yeah, uh, there's an unlimited number of users that can access uh, the signals from the satellites. When we are speaking of GNSS, maybe most people are more familiar with the term uh, GPS, which is just the American system. But nowadays, also the Galileo, the European system, and the GLONASS, the Russian system and the Baidu, the Chinese system are available. And by combining the observations of these different global navigation satellite systems, you can get even, even better uh, accuracy of your determined positions and uh, velocities. And yeah, since we have an unlimited amount of users that can use these techniques simultaneously, it's also possible to put up a lot of geodetic observation uh, stations. And nowadays, there are at least 20,000 geodetic quality GMSS stations available, which means that for these stations, we can determine their positions with an accuracy that is at the low millimeter level. Now, in the uh, next few minutes, I will show you some examples where uh, GNSS can be used in different countries and parts of the world to measure certain geoscientific phenomena. For example, if we start in, in Sweden, and we have a station here uh, called RED0, and yeah, our GNSS system is in place to send the signals, uh, which can be then recorded by the station, and we do this over long time spans, we can get uh, a time series of the station positions and how it changes over time. We can get then uh, a three-dimensional coordinate uh, time series like uh, in this plot shown, for example, for the east, the north, and the up component. And there you can see actually strong uh, movements. First of all, in the horizontal coordinate con uh, components, you can uh, strongly see the impact of plate motion. This can be up to several centimeters uh, per year and will be visible in most uh, GNSS time series that you are dealing with. Quite interesting for the station in Sweden, however, is the strong change in the up component, or the vertical. And here, uh, this part is related to the post-glacial rebound, which Rebecca tell us uh, more about in, uh, within this webinar. Yeah, then we can also put a station at another uh, place on the Earth, for example, here in uh, New Zealand, and the time series might look completely different. Here, uh, we have another very striking phenomena, namely a big jump in the time series. This is, uh, in this case, related to a very strong earthquake, which happened in the year 2016, the Kalikura earthquake of magnitude 7.8. And you can see that the coordinates, primarily the horizontal coordinates, have been affected significantly by offsets of more than half a meter. Yeah, um, 
since we are already speaking of earthquakes, this is, for example, also visible in Japan, where there's a very dense network of uh, GNSS stations available. And uh, this animation shows the deformation due to the Tohoku Oki earthquake during the year 2011, which caused an offset of uh, multiple meters actually in the horizontal uh, components. You can see uh, the ground deformation lasting much longer than uh, during the uh, earthquake. Uh, it's also uh, then uh, causing an aftershock here, which can be well observed uh, by GNSS. Maybe a very different example, uh, completely other part of the world would be here in Hawaii. Uh, this is uh, uh, an example of using GNSS uh, to uh, monitor the uh, uh, canic, uh, uh, yeah, the volcano and the related deformation of the surface of the earth due to the uh, yeah, changing uh, magma within the volcano. And you can see that there are ground deformations away from uh, yeah, the center of the volcano, which uh, yeah, can be quite interesting uh, when monitoring uh, the characteristics and the state of the volcano, and if there would be the potential of uh, future eruptions. Yeah, uh, finally, an example from uh, California, where uh, GNSS can be used to uh, monitor seasonal deformations due to the load from snow and water. You can, for example, see that uh, during uh, the winter months, there's a lot of accumulation of snow and then also water, while in the uh, spring and summer, all this melts and um, uh, this load is then removed. And as a result, we can see a strong uplift in the vertical genus S components, as you can see in this plot, where we have uplift of several uh, millimeters up to a centimeter in, in uh, yeah, uh, California to, to this uh, changing uh, hydrological uh, conditions. So these were some examples from specific locations all over the world. Um, if we put all these stations together and uh, uh, compute their positions uh, in a joint manner, we can actually uh, determine a global coordinate system, which is very important for geodesy and many different applications. And we refer to this coordinate system as the terrestrial reference frame. Here in this plot, you can see the changes of these coordinates, uh, the linear changes as in uh, velocities, where you can uh, clearly see the plate motions that um, drive these uh, very strong uh, motions that we see. Yeah, the terrestrial reference frame uh, defines this coordinate system in terms of where the origin, the orientation, and uh, the scale is. It is based not only actually on GNSS data, but in combination with uh, the other techniques that I mentioned earlier, for example, very long baseline interferometry, satellite laser imaging, and DORIS. And overall, uh, it captures very well the uh, yeah, long-term behavior of stations all over the world. So why do we actually need this terrestrial reference frame? There are quite a few applications, in, for example, positioning, to make sure that all these uh, techniques that we are using work that well also for Earth system monitoring, but quite an important application also for our climate would be uh, for sea level monitoring. And there the origin of the reference frame is very important since if you would make uh, a change or an error in the C coordinate of the origin of the coordinate system it has been shown that this dramatically affects the sea level that, has, that would be derived from altimetry uh, missions. And yeah, uh, this would result, for example, this one centimeter change in uh, uh, sea level difference at the uh, millimeter level, which is uh, already uh, the level where we want to determine, uh, at which we want to determine uh, these signals. And if you want to find out more about terrestrial reference frames, I can only recommend you to come back uh, next week, um, where we'll have the talk by uh, Xavier Coyier on uh, also this uh, uh, seminar uh, series. And yeah, in that uh, context, I should finally also mention that the uh, reference frames are also supported now and officially recognized by 
the United Nations, there has been a resolution on a terrestrial reference frame uh, in order to maintain them and uh, improve them into the future. Yeah, and with that, I will uh, now finish the geometry part and hand over uh, back to Andreas. Now we move from uh, geometry to gravity and mass change. And in the context of geodesy, when we talk about um, gravity or Earth's gravitational field, we uh, typically talk about the physical shape of our planet. Um, uh, it reflects Earth's mass distribution. So uh, as you uh, all know from your first physics lectures, um, if we have an aggregation of mass particles, we do have um, a unique gravity field that these generate. And Earth is nothing different. It's just a very large aggregation of mass particles. And since the gravitational field reflects this mass distribution and changes thereof, um, observing the gravitational field uh, essentially gives us data of a key quantity for many Earth and space sciences. Um, if you look at the gravity field model, so essentially, uh, once we've gathered all our satellite data, our terrestrial observations and so on, put that through our processing chain, we end up with a gravity field model, uh, as we call it. And uh, these typically do have some um, static components or a mean field, but also um, uh, temporal changes that we see. And uh, this particular model, for example, contains a long-term trend. And just by um, looking at this trend, uh, we can see that um, our gravity measurements very well reflect um, geophysical signals. So we can see these large uh, red uh, blobs in Antarctica, Greenland, uh, and Alaska. So we see in our gravity measurements essentially the ice mass loss that we have in these large ice sheets. Um, if we go to seasonal changes, so to the middle panel, um, there we can see um, uh, the annual amplitude uh, of the seasonal cycle. And this is dominated by uh, terrestrial um, water storage changes, so by hydrology essentially. We can see, for example, the Amazon basin or if you look at the, at the bottom plot in Southeast Asia, we can see the Ganges um, or the Mekong basin where we have these large mass variations that we see in the gravity field. And if you look at the static, so the non-time variable part of the gravity field, we can see quite a lot of um, topographical features like deep sea trenches, so the Mariana Trench, for example. We see island chains like Hawaii, uh, but also see um, large mountain ranges such as the Himalaya or the Andes. So the static gravity field gives us information or uh, constraints for the structure uh, of the Earth. Um, if we go back to these time variations, um, the changes that we see in Earth's gravity field uh, are driven by geophysical processes. And in turn, if we continuously measure uh, and monitor gravity field changes, we can gather uh, quite a lot of important information about these processes. Um, I've just plotted uh, four examples here. This is obviously not a complete list, but I've already mentioned in the introduction ice sheet mass loss, but we can also look at, for example, hydrologically extreme events like flooding through gravity fields, um, ocean currents uh, and solid earth processes like um, earthquakes or um, glacial as a static adjustment, which Rebecca will talk about later. Um, we have a few tools on how we can monitor and observe the gravity field and its changes. And two of the most, most important tools we have for that are the the satellite missions GRACE, which was in orbit from 2002 until 2017, and the successor mission um, 
Grace Forlorn, which was launched in 2018 and is uh, still in orbit and giving us uh, very good data. Um, I've mentioned in the, be the beginning that essentially geometry, gravity field, uh, and the orientation of the Earth is very much interconnected within the geodesy. And we can see that here because the primary measurements that we actually use to determine the gravity field are geometrical ones. So in these two missions, we use GPS tracking, so the position and velocity of the satellites, as well as very precise intersatellite ranging measurements to determine uh, gravitational changes from changes in the satellite motion. But um, we cannot observe uh, gravity, the gravity field solely from space. We also can uh, put gravimeters, gravimeters, for example, uh, directly on the ground, um, which you can see in the left picture. We can mount them on ships and um, airplanes or helicopters, for example. In these data, um, also widely used for geophysical applications. Um, why do we have such a variety of different sensors for observing the gravity field? Um, because uh, one caveat that is present in gravimetry is that the further I essentially go away from Earth's surface, the lower the spatial resolution uh, I get. So essentially, if I move away from this Earth's surface, I only see a smoothed version of the gravity field. So for extremely um, localized phenomena, uh, phenomena, I would use uh, terrestrial gravimetry. But if I would want to look at large spatial scales, I can use satellite gravimetry. And if I use satellite gravimetry, this has the advantage that I also get higher spatial coverage. So essentially, GRACE and GRACE for on, uh, these two satellite missions I talked about, give us a global map of gravity field or mass changes um, every month. And we can uh, essentially put these um, one after another. And so we get a time series, monthly time series of uh, almost 20 years at the moment. Um, the question is, now we have gravity measurements and more, most geophysicists are uh, interested in mass change because uh, I want to directly see how much uh, ice is melting or how much ground, groundwater am I losing. And that's a little bit tricky because um, essentially um, uh, the relation between mass and the gravity field is not unique. So you can have infinitely many mass distributions which explain the gravity field that we observe. But we kind of, um, uh, if you take the information that we have about the geophysics that are gone in the Earth system, we can essentially restrict our solution space because uh, we say that, okay, most of the mass change that we expect happens on a very small, uh, very shallow um, layer around Earth's surface. And if you think about the geophysical processes that we observe, atmosphere mass change, oceanic mass, mass change, or the hydrosphere, um, they happen at or around Earth's surface, which is very shallow compared to the complete radius of Earth. So we have this direct connection between the gravity field and the mass distributions at Earth's surface. And with that, we can now do very, very cool things. Um, because uh, one of the advantages that we have with gravimetry is that we measure the integrated mass change. So we don't have a single geophysical process that we um, specialize at, but we measure everything that goes on. And if our measurements contain everything, then we also can start looking at each individual sub process. And essentially, our measurements are the sum of atmosphere, ocean, hydrosphere, ice sheets, and solid earth, and so on. So if you want to look at, for example, um, water storage changes, so hydrological applications, we can take our measurements and just subtract everything else. If we have a reasonably good idea of what's going on uh, in the other subsystems. Or for example, 
if I want to look at solid earth processes, I can do the same approach. Just take the grace mass change, subtract everything else, and I can look at, for example, the mass changes that an earthquake has caused. And this um, very uh, this versatility that gravimetry or satellite gravimetry gives us um, is very much reflected in how much this data is used and how important it is to geoscience. Um, I just took uh, some stats from the uh, GRACE TELOS website hosted by NASA. And GRACE and GRACE for on are the second most cited uh, NASA satellite mission in the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change Assessment Report 6. And it contributes to 14 essential climate variables uh, of GCOS. And uh, another very uh, uh, almost surreal stat is that as of August this year, um, there are uh, five, over 5,000 publications that involve GRACE or GRACE and GRACE follow-on data, which uh, JPL tracks. So I guess there are much more. And with this um, very um, optimistic outlook on how much GRACE can contribute to um, geosciences as a whole, I will then, I think, um, hop or hand over to Rebecca. Yes. Thank you, Andreas and Benedict, for giving me a good introduction into um, in the geodesy. So I'm now showing you an application of geodesy, uh, in especially glacial aesthetic adjustment. Um, glacial aesthetic adjustment is abbreviated as GIA. And um, you see in this word cloud of GIA, um, there are many processes related to GIA. We, of course, have glacial aesthetic adjustment, but we also have sea level change. We have viscosity, we have lithosphere. So many processes from different ge geoscientific disciplines are um, affected by GIA. But what is GIA? So GIA is the response of the solid earth to ice mass changes. Um, so if you, for example, have an ice sheet here, and if we melt this ice sheet, we get a response of the solid earth in form of an uplifting. And in addition, we get a response of the sea surface because the melting ice or the, the ice sheet itself is in gravitational attraction to the water. And when we decrease the mass here, we also release some attraction. So the water decreases as well, which in, also in turn means if we get a new sea surface, we also induce subsiding or uplifting beneath the sea surface as well. If we now at the go on and have no ice left in the lower graph, um, we have then ongoing rebound because um, the earth is not entirely elastic. It responds in the first part of the years, it responds elastically, but with the mantle being viscously, there is a time dependent process involved. So when we have no ice left anymore on the earth's surface, we still have the on rebound ongoing in the area where we had an ice sheet. This also means that we have an additional adjustment of the sea surface. And because we have the mantle, some, something has to fill the gap in here where we have the uplifting. We have mantle flowing in, which also means that the bulge developed here during the glaciation is collapsing. So this is a general concept of GIA. And now we can observe this with different disciplines. We have geodetic observables, where we have 3D land motion observed by GNSS and INSA, a satellite technique. GNSS was, was explained by Benedict already. We have gravity changes, um, ground base and satellite data. We have changes in the Earth's rotation parameters, for example, two polar wonder, polar motion, and length of the day. And we have also can see relative sea level changes, for example, from tide gauges and satellite altimetry data. In addition to this, we also have paleo observations, more geological observations. Again, relative sea level, where we observe the shoreline deformation, lake levels tilting, and seismicity that we have seen in the past. I don't want to focus on these. I want to focus now on the geodetic observables today. So as we already uh, saw from Benedict's talk, we have the 3D motion of the um, areas where we had or have ice sheets. 
for example, in Northern Europe and Canada, where we had large ice sheets about 20,000 years ago, and also in Greenland, where we still have a large ice sheet uh, lying, we still, in all areas, we see uplifting. In Fenoscandia, in Northern Europe, we have up to 11 millimeters per year of uplift. In uh, a city called, around the city called Umeå in North Central Sweden, it's a bit larger uplift in Canada is up to 40 millimeters per year. This is mainly because we had a larger ice sheet. Yes, low and tight ice sheet had a larger area and also larger thickness than the Northern European ice sheet. And we also see la land uplift in Greenland because the uh, Greenland ice sheet was much larger 20,000 years ago than today. So we, of course, in see this uh, time dependent process of the viscous mantle also in the Greenland uh, observations. In addition to the vertical land uplift, we also see a horizontal motion as shown for the Northern European data set. Um, and the velocities are going out of the uplift maximum. Not only GNSS can contribute to observing land uplift induced by or due to GAA, we also see it from INSA, where we measure also the change in height and the uh, change in the east-west uh, direction. This is an example for Iceland, where we also can clearly identify the uplift happening due to the recent ice mass losses on the Iceland glaciers. As we already saw from uh, Andrea, so we have gravity changes also affecting the solid Earth. We can see how solid Earths are moving. So we have the satellite data from GRACE, uh, now for Fenoscandia on Northern Europe and for the, uh, Northern, uh, North America. And we see an, uh, a positive signal, which is due to the mantle inflow. So it shows us more how the future is going on, where the GNSS is giving us a more um, today snapshot of the land uplift. We see a similar signal when we use count data. Uh, for example, for these data sets, absolute gravity data were obtained for several years. So we have here at, um, a time series for station Vasa, which is about here in Finland. <clears throat> and absolute gravity was measured several times over several years. You see a long time span from before 1990 until 2020. And so we see a decrease in the gravity change compared to the gray satellite where we had an positive gravity change. We now have a negative gravity change, also seen for the entire area using several absolute gravity observations. This is due to that the land is uplifting, so the station on the surface is getting further away from the Earth's center and so it further away from the gravity midpoint. Then we have the changes in the Earth's rotation parameters as one of the GA observables. Um, we have, for example, two polar wonder and polar motion. These are observed by several um, satellite systems. So what Bennett already mentioned, VAPI, DORUS, and SLR are used to, to look, at, look at the Earth's rotation parameters. And what, what does it mean? Why, why does it change when we have an ice mass changes? Uh, when the, we have the rotation axis of the Earth shown by this black line. And when we decrease the ice mass, we the rotation axis moves because the shape of the solid Earth changes and the GUE changes. And this is also observed uh, over many years, meanwhile, and we see a change in the rotation axis wandering around towards the Hudson Bay in Canada. But this obser observed change in rotation, uh, observed polar motion cannot be explained only by GAA. We also need to include other processes, and for example, geodynamic processes geodynamic mantle convection models also help us to explain the entire field, uh, entire Earth rotation parameter changes. Another parameter is the length of day. And again, because we redistribute water and ice masses, we get a different, uh, we get uh, shorter and longer days. For example, when we have an, uh, build an ice load during a glaciation towards uh, along the poles, this is similar to when and a figure skater closes, uh, gets the arms close to the body, it spins faster than when the arms are widen. And the uh, opposite happens when we melt the ice sheet, we get the water towards the equator, so we get a bulge around the equator, and it's similar when the figure skater 
spins the, uh, spins the arms outside and it then it's uh, slower than having the arms closer. And this was then also observed, can be still observed as a change in length of the day. And the last geodetic GIA observer is relative sea level. This can be observed by tight gauges. <clears throat> tight gauges exist for several hundred of years in some areas of the world. Um, while we see here from 1880 to 1889, we had only a few stations and these were increasing remarkably in the last 100 years. But you see that most of these stations are located along the Northern Hemisphere. Also see in the graph up here, most of the stations are Northern Hemisphere, while we only have a few in the Southern Hemisphere. Of course, it would be better to get a homogeneous data set with stations uh, over all areas in the world. But how does these tight gauge station uh, results look like? So we get a, a change in water level. The tight gauge is measuring the change in water level. You can uh, exclude some, or we can calculate out some um, signals, for example, tides. And then you can look at this uh, trend over many years. And this is for a Stockholm st station in Sweden, one of the oldest station. And you see a clear decrease in water level which is not really a decrease in water, but it's a land uplifting. And that's why water is get, getting further away from the, from the land, basically. Um, the line, the trend line shown here is the induced GAA, or this is a GAA uplift. And the deviation from the water level from this line is showing us that we have now additional sea level increase happening in the area. And this can be done for several stations, as I told you already, and you see then this uh, the GAA effect in most of these stations, and you can correct for this, and then you can analyze these data that with respect to uh, other processes. As I already said, we have only a few tight gauge stations available. Um, we would like to have a complete map of how the sea level is changing, so we can also use satellite altimetry, a geodetic uh, method as well, and then we cover most of the oceanic area. And combined then with tight gauge station and, and GPS data, we can get a complete view of sea level change. And this is uh, shown here. We have an, the sea level change obtained from altimetry. If we now take even the ocean mass change by grace, which is the um, ice melt coming into the ocean, uh, we can then see the steric changes, which of course is a uh, valuable uh, result for ocean aquifers to study the temperature differences and salinity. We can now take all these observations and now we want to model GA because when we model GA, we can say something about the future, how land uplift is going on in the areas where we had ice sheet, where we still have an ice sheet. How does this GA model look like? So we have two inputs. We have an ice and ocean loading and we have the earth structure. We model entire earth. And then we can run such a GA model and get several outputs, which is then compare again to the observations that I showed you before. And we can vary the Earth parameters. There are many uh, variations possible. And in addition is that how the GA or how the solid Earth responds to the ice and ocean loading has an effect again on the ice and ocean loading as well. So we have to iterate several times to get the uh, realistic result. Um, <clears throat> GA models unfortunately have some uncertainties. If you look at the uh, GNSS velocities uh, for today, we cannot, from these alone, we cannot identify if we had a large ice loss or a small ice loss, depending on what time it was, or if we have a large ice loss and a weak Earth versus a small ice loss and a strong Earth. An observation of GNSS data today wouldn't tell us a difference. So we also need then geological data to give us more indications. In addition, if we have the 1D uplift rate versus a 3D uplift rate, this means only that 1D is a homogeneous Earth model with only variations in the with depth, while a 3D model is a lateral heterogeneous Earth model, way more realistically, including seismological observations. We see that there is a difference in the uplift rate, and we have to um, explain our uplift rate that we observe, of course, with 3D models, 3D Earth models. Another factor is that <clears throat> GA models can have different rheologies and different rheological parameters. And one is the Poisson ratio, giving us information about the compressibility of a model. And there are two options. And 
these two options give us can give us completely different results in horizontal velocities. So we have uh, geodynamic parameters, that's logical parameters, which are important to include in our GA models to explain our observations or geodetic observations better. Um, and GA is, for some, it's what they want to achieve, what they want to look at. For some, it's only a noise, basically. So what Andreas already showed, we can have a gray strand. And if you now take a GA model output, we can look at the differences. And these differences are then can be um, taken into account when we look at atmosphere changes, ocean changes, hydrological changes, ice sheet changes, or solid earth without GA. So you saw that GA involves many disciplines, uh, which each divisions deal with GA. Um, of course, it's geodesy that uh, we have observations, but there are many other disciplines in EGU looking at GA as well. So we have geodynamics because we are doing the modeling, the cryosphere sciences because we have the ice sheet, we need ice mass balances and so on. And with this, um, I would like to wrap up our uh, geodesy webinar. So you have seen that geodesy can help you to study mass changes with grace. Um, for example, ice loss, groundwater depletion, earthquakes, GAA. <clears throat> and we can also look at position changes with GNSS. Similar uh, observations as above, but, but also landslides and other sea level as well. Um, and Geodesy provides a global terrestrial reference frames um, for accurate sea level monitoring, which is needed to look also into the future. And of course, there's also much more. And with this, I already hand over to Simon. Uh, thanks so much for that. We have a, a short amount of time for uh, questions. Um, as a few, I can go through uh, the Q&A box. Um, the first one I want to ask uh, is, which errors are involved in gravity measurements and how are they handled? Um, I think it's an open question if anyone mm. wants to jump in on it. Yeah, so I, I'll try to answer that very broadly because the, the measurement errors that we have um, very much depend on the system that we use. Um, if you think about satellite gravimetry, um, then the measurement error that we have at satellite altitude, then that's a purely geometrical error because we use in grace and grace for on. We have um, GPS measurements and these intersatellite distances that we use. And this propagates uh, then into our gravity field. And um, key fact of satellite gravimetry is that this error, the measurement error gets uh, exponentially higher the smaller um, spatial scales we look at. Um, this means uh, essentially the if we look at the gravity field level we can treat the satellite gravimetry measurement error with a low pass filter. So filtering grace gravity fields with a low pass filter essentially gets rid of most of the um, measure, uh, observation measurement errors that we have in there. Um, if we go down to, um, for example, airborne uh, gravimetry, um, there the system is quite complex because you need to track the state, the position, velocity of the, the acceleration of the of the plane that you have. You have to take care of all the vibrations, and um, I feel that's a very much um, sensor setup to sensor setup. Uh, approach and how to deal with the errors that you have there. So I don't, uh, I can't give a concrete answer for for that. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Um, just uh, speaking of Grace, let me quickly move on to another question um, of what is the output of Grace itself. Um. So there are there are in the Grace community we talk about data levels and um, for the user, the most interesting data levels, the data output levels that we have is level two, which is gravity field. Um, so you have um, a potential, so meter squared per second squared. And then you have level three um, uh, data, 
which is already converted into mass change. And mass change is typically expressed in equivalent water height. This means uh, you can think of it as a shallow layer of, of water around the Earth's surface, and you have to increase uh, this layer by one centimeter of water there and reduce it one centimeter there to explain the gravity field that we measure. So thank you. Um, so moving on from that, you mentioned uh, gravity field models. Uh, what advice do you have for someone who wants to carry out an internal accuracy assessment for those models? Um, there is, I, I don't think there is a straightforward answer to that. Um, but some advice that I would give is if you have uh, terrestrial gravity data available, these are a good starting point to evaluate satellite models, for example. That's what we do when we, when we produce such a gravity field model to get a feel of um, how good it performs. Uh, if we talk about the mass change level, then you have a little bit more options because the data there is a lot more varied. You can use um, GNSS displacements, uh, essentially loading observations, which can um, be very uh, easily correlated with the mass change that we measure from GRACE. So these would be the two approaches that I would take. Uh, thanks um, so much for your answers. I think we have time perhaps for uh, just one more question. Um, I was wondering, and this is perhaps more application focused, but uh, can GIA, for example, be used to measure uh, sea surface topographies or other such applications? That's too specific, don't worry about it. <laughs> um, well, I mean, GIA itself not. Um, GIA is just one of the processes that if we understand it really well, and are able to model really well using all the advanced methodologies, it will be a good correction model for all other disciplines at the end. That's the only way how GA can contribute in this direction. Excellent. Uh, thanks for your answer. Um, and maybe one final question before I wrap up. Uh, last question here is how do I understand the scale parameter? in terms of the terrestrial reference frame. Yeah, that's for me. Yeah, yeah you can imagine like uh, if this would be the size of the Earth and you would change the scale, then you would basically increase the size or increase it. So it's um, basically a change in the height of all your uh, observation stations. And since the height is quite a delicate parameter to determine, which has typically the most errors, it's actually quite challenging to determine the scale accurately. So there are uh, techniques that are better suited for that, for example, very long baseline interferometry. And for other techniques like GNSS, you would need really precise knowledge about the phase centers of your antennas. So uh, it's quite important, especially for sea level change, uh, because this is also related to the height. And uh, yeah, it's still uh, a lot of effort being put to uh, determine the scale very precisely. Excellent. Um, with that, we're just about to run out of time. So uh, I just want to wrap up uh, this webinar. I want to thank our speakers, Andreas, Rebecca, and Benedict, for joining today and delivering uh, such information. I <laughs> learned a lot myself. I thank all the attendees who uh, came today, listened and asked questions.